Um, one double three six nine three. I want to know if you're a NIMBY, and not in my backyard, a YIMBY, yes, in my backyard, or a TIMBY, which is courtesy of an article written in The Age today by uh, Cara Waters, a TIMBY, a thoughtfully in my backyard. One double three six nine three. Uh, the Royal Historical Society of Victoria has warned Melbourne's heritage will be put at risk and suburbs will be less desirable if the government pushes ahead with its Suburban Activity Centres plan, a plan to increase residential density around transport options like train stations. This is a very, very uh, broad and impactful plan. We're talking about 50 of these centres. The Royal Historical Society of Victoria has denied a NIMBY status. Chief Charles Sowerwine, I hope I got that right, has instead pushed for TIMBY thoughtfully in my backyard. In other words, attempting to balance the competing requirements of both, uh, well, heritage architecture and the, the need for people to live in some sort of accommodation. Jonathan O'Brien joins me now. He's a lead organiser of Yimby Melbourne. It's an advocacy group. Good afternoon, Jonathan. Good afternoon. How are you? Very well, Jonathan. So who funds you? Are you uh, funded on behalf of anybody who may have a vested interest in uh, these centres being built? We are a 100% volunteer advocacy group with about four figures in the bank that we raise yep. off of our members. We pay 20 bucks a year. Okay. That is all we have. All right. So what is your argument? And I, I, you are quoted in this article as, I guess, the counterpoint to uh, the argument that uh, we don't want heritage buildings to just be wiped away in the name of rampant construction. I hope I'm not mischaracterizing that, but what's your counter argument? My counter argument is that there's nothing in the policy that actually says that any heritage building is going to disappear. Heritage controls are not being touched in the upzoning that is going to go on around these key activity centres. Mm. And um, the Historical Society are peddling misinformation rather than, you know, worrying about where their grandkids are going to live. Oh, okay, well, that's the emotive side of the argument. But uh, is the point not being made that you, you can have an old building that might be one or two storeys, but around it is going to uh, just emerge all these 20-storey uh, buildings is, and so affecting the amenity of these particular areas? No, I don't think that's the case at all. Look, um, if you think about inner-city pubs, there are a lot of really wonderful inner-city pubs, for instance, and inner-city low-level buildings that do have taller buildings next to them. Now, most of these activity centres, there's not going to be 20-storey buildings. There's going to be sort of 6 to 8 to 12-storey buildings. Um, completely reasonable scale. And the reality is that in our inner city, there we have these beautiful heritage pubs that do have buildings on top of them, that do mm. have buildings next to them. They're still wonderful places that people love to be. The idea that we have to leave everything untouched um, in order for it to have any value is kind of anathema to what it means to live in a city. Uh, that's a good point. Tell me who is part of your organisation. Are these aspirational homeowners or, or aspirational future apartment dwellers? Yeah, sure. So we have obviously a large proportion of our membership are renters and young people, but actually about 50% of our, our, our membership are owners. They're people who are in their 40s or older mm -hmm. who see their kids growing up and understand that their kids need someone to live as well. And they'd much rather their kids be able to move into an apartment in the areas where they live rather than having to, you know, drive an hour out to see their grandkids for the next 20 years. Uh, these are our members are people who fundamentally recognize that if you have two kids and you have one house and you want both your kids to move out and live near you, then you're going to need three homes where there's currently one. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not making any more land, but what we can do is build thoughtfully, as the Heritage Society put, uh, we can build thoughtfully, we can build densely, and we can build homes that people want to live in, in the places where they want to live, and allow families and communities to continue to exist. Okay. How can we have a YIMBY approach? Well, you mentioned the old buildings, but a YIMBY approach and still conserve intangible heritage like green spaces and skylines so you're not crowded out. And, and that, you know, that word I mentioned earlier, amenability. Yeah, sure. So I think a way to think about it is if you wanted to double Melbourne's population, mm. um, which is what we're sort of looking at uh, is going to happen sort of over the next 25, 30 years. If you want to double Melbourne's population, you can do that by building six storeys on about 2 to 3% of the land. The reality is that we don't have to build towers everywhere. We can actually say, right, we're actually going to broadly allow 
this sort of soft, gentle, medium density across our city. And it's going to be built, yes, probably around train stations, because let's face it, that's where we want to put people. We want to put people where they have options to travel. But it doesn't have to be the entire city, and it won't be the entire city. But if we're going to pick places where we're going to build density, I think we should do it around our strong existing infrastructure. You know, it's easier to rejig the train timetable, run out of the tram, fix the bus network, than it is to build an entirely new uh, satellite city out in Pakenham. Okay, I'm yet to be convinced of the merits of doubling the population of this city because I simply don't understand why we're doing it. Could you explain it to me, what the merit is of doubling the population of Melbourne? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, people want to live here and we should enable people to live here. When you have more people in a city, you're able to be more productive, you get more industry, you get more innovation, um, and there's fundamentally better amenity. Look, why does Melbourne have the best food in the entire world? It has the best food in the entire world because we've allowed so many people to come and move here. Um, I think it's great. I think the fact that Melbourne is a big city is a fundamentally good thing. Look, if you want Melbourne to be smaller, I suggest you leave first. That's the reality. No, like, like if you want should, a smaller it, Melbourne, it, it, you no, leave. It, should, but, it shouldn't come down to that. I, I was here. I pay taxes here. I have a, a family here. I just do, I don't get the argument that growth for its own sake is, uh, is a good I, d- well, I really okay, don't in terms of... So, so suburbs where we haven't seen any growth, for yeah. instance, are the suburbs where small businesses are closing or indeed where they're not even able to open. Because mm. if you lower the customer base and you have a whole bunch of empty nesters, um, but costs go up as they do over time, mm. you actually limit the ability for the people who are here, for your kids, for your grandkids to actually thrive. Look, it's not growth for growth's sake. It's oh, not no, some it seems conspiracy to be. It, theory. No, that's, it's, it's not a the theory. It's the reality of how a city works. No, no, that's not a theory. It's just you load more people into the country to create demand for businesses that already exist. So, look, I, and that, that is growth for its own sake, I would argue. Um, I want to know this. Your idea of thoughtfully in my backyard, it's a term, you're a YIMBY, uh, people who are Timbies, uh, who are going to become part of this debate, what do you say to them? Do you, what I, do you make of that idea or, as a concept? I think Timby is NIMBY, but you're losing the argument. Hang on, okay, explain that. I think if you're if you're doing if you're doing if you're doing Timby, if you're saying thoughtfully in my backyard, you're saying I'm a NIMBY, but I think my argument is good. Okay. That's, that's all it is. It's 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 peddling. The reality is that anything that isn't a yes is a no. Um, I don't accept this this whitewashing of what is ultimately an anti-housing perspective being yeah. peddled by a whole bunch of old conservatives who have no interest in a better city for young people. <laughs> okay. There's, um, there's the, a bit of uh, friction between the generations here. Then Jonathan O'Brien, lead organiser of Yimby Melbourne. How big should Melbourne be then? Melbourne should be as big as the number of people who want to live here, and we should enable them to do that because we are a country that actually has the ability to build things and yeah. deliver things. And this idea that Australia is a country that cannot do things, that cannot provide for more people, is defeatist. It's a pathetic attitude, and we need to have a country that can actually thrive. We're a good country. We're yeah, a country true. full of very capable people. Yeah, Okay, we agree on that wholeheartedly. Um, Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan O'Brien, as I said, lead organiser of Yimby Melbourne. Pro-growth, the bigger the better.